Hi, everyone. So as we all know, reinforcement learning is great to build machines that gain better performance on some non-trivial games like the Atari video games or the game of Go. That reinforcement learning is also good at explaining human behavior may be somewhat surprising given that most reinforcement learning methods assume full observability, technically a mock of decision process, while humans are constantly faced with partial observability. For example, already pretty young children rem remember re remarkably well in which room they have left their favorite toy or where it is hidden, as we've seen in uh, Liz Belke's talk um, uh, on Friday. Or when we go shopping, we may remember that the cheese in the fridge is probably too old to still be eaten and buy a new one. Now, in both these examples, the immediate actions are not solely driven by the immediate stimulus, but it also depends on uh, the current state of the episodic memory of the agent. Now, reinforcement learning in partially observable domains is known to be difficult. So how come humans don't seem to struggle with these situations? To shed light on this question, it may be interesting to look at another species that excels in a partially observable domain. Food caching birds, like nutcrackers and jays, cache thousands of food items uh, in one year, seeds, nuts, insects, in different places in the environment. Recovery is based only on visual cues, and with a very high success rate, they recover their own caches after hours, days, months, sometimes even covered under a few centimeters of snow. These birds have been studied extensively in the lab over the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, and the experimenters can manipulate the motivational states of these birds through different feeding schedules, uh, they can provide them visually distinct ice cube trays, as, as you can see them here, for, um, for caching food items. And they can manipulate the retrieval time and the quality of the retrieved food. For example, they can pilfer, that is, steal all the food items in one of the caching trays, but not another one. Or they can degrade, that is, turn unpalatable, one of the food types, but not another food type. Now, the 28 experiments that I want to focus on today uh, have revealed that these birds show motivational control. That is, their eating and caching behavior is, not surprisingly, dependent on what they have just eaten. Second, these birds have an amazing ability to remember what they have cached where and how long ago. That is, these birds have an episodic-like memory. And third, these birds learn to, uh, to adapt their caching behavior um, to anticipated future needs. That is, they learn to cache in sites that are likely to be accessible uh, when they're hungry in the future. Now, this last series of experiment uh, has been somewhat controversial in its interpretation. On one hand, these experiments have been taken as evidence uh, for mental time travel, sorry, for mental time travel, that is, the idea that these birds, at the moment of caching, for example, think back in time, oh yeah, I, I was caching at this site uh, previously, and then at the moment of retrieval, uh, I was not satisfied with the outcome, but maybe some other bird has stolen the food at that site, so better, it's better not to cache again at this site. Or that they look ahead and think, ah, tomorrow morning I will be again nearby this place, so I will be hungry, so I better cache something that I would like to have for breakfast tomorrow morning. Now, uh, on the other hand, there has also been a simple uh, mnemonic associative account to explain at least part of these experiments, uh, where the result of these experiments would be just a consequence of a simple learning uh, mechanism at the time of retrieval. Now, one of our goals uh, of this study, pure computational study, was to look at this controversy with a computational model. More generally, we asked the question, can the rich behavior that we see in these 28 experiments be explained with just standard concepts of computational neuroscience, such as associative half-filled memories or reward-modulated synaptic plasticity, that is, model-free reinforcement learning? Now, how did we approach this question? 
The first step was uh, to formalize all the experimental protocols in a model-independent domain-specific language. So what I did is I went through all the publications, took the description, the verbal description of the um, uh, of, of the experimental procedure and turned it into code that is uh, a function that takes model birds as input, runs through a sequence of steps described in this domain-specific language and returns a summary of the experiment. This domain-specific language needed only a very limited vocabulary. So there are a few actions, uh, there are only three types of objects and a handful of properties and this is all that was needed to formalize all the 28 experiments um, that I focus on today. Now, the summary that is returned by this function consists of the statistical tests, uh, the means and the standard errors of the mean, everything that I could extract from the respective publications, from the text and the figure. Unfortunately, I don't have individual bird data. Now, after extracting and computing uh, the, the, the summaries of the, simulate, of the simulations, I can compare the summary of simulated experiments with the summary of, uh, the, that is reported in the paper, and this is just a function of the tests and the means and the, and the standard errors of the mean as extracted from the paper. Now, to capture individual differences between birds, I sample all the model parameters that characterize an individual bird from a normal distribution with some mean and the diagonal covariance matrix. This mean and standard uh, deviation is fitted with an approximate maximum likelihood method. And I want to stress here that for everything that I show in this talk today, there is one M and one S for all the 28 experiments. In the abstract that you find online, I fitted the experiments uh, individually. Here, as I said, everything is based on the same set of, experiment, uh, of, of parameters, of metaparameters. So we propose a memory augmented reinforcement learning model to capture the behavior in these uh, experiments. In our model, the probability of an action uh, to eat, cash, retrieve a food item, or do something that is unrelated to the current experiment depends not only on the visual input from which we can extract uh, the food types and the cache site features, but it also depends on three internal states, the hunger variables, the state of the associative memory, and on two types of um, plastic synaptic weights that determine the caching preference and the retrieval preferences. I will now walk you quickly through a brief description of these three internal states, the hunger variable, the associative memory, and uh, the plastic weights. I'll illustrate the hunger modulation with uh, this example. This is an example trace from one of the simulated birds on one of the uh, experimental protocols. In the top row, you see that the experimenter chose to remove maintenance diet from time to time and add cacheable and eatable food items from time to time in the second row. In the third row, you see that uh, hunger increased during the times where a maintenance diet was not available to the bird, and you can see that some actions were recorded. If we zoom into one of these regions, uh, we can see that the number of mealworms and peanuts that were given to the bird in this example decreased over time. So did the hunger variables. I used here not one hunger variable, but multiple hunger variables to capture the effect of specific satiety. That is the phenomenon that even after being satiated on one type of food, birds still like to eat another type of food. Like we may still want to eat a dessert, maybe even after being satiated on uh, the main dish. And in the bottom row, you see that uh, you see, see the actions taken by the simulated bird. Uh, at the different moments in time, where the height of the dot indicates the weight of this action at the moment of making the decision. And what you see, can see is that as a consequence of hunger modulation, the weight of the eat and cash actions decreases over time. So um, we did not quantize time, uh, but instead introduced random timeouts after each action integrated hunger, uh, the hunger dynamics in continuous time, and like this we can really faithfully follow the timings given in the experimental protocols uh, that the experimentalist chose. 
With this simple model, we can capture, for example, the main effects uh, uh, seen in this uh, experiment here. Details don't matter. What I want you to focus on is that it's just that the red line basically stays constant. The blue line goes down a little bit uh, for this experiment. Now, the actual experiments, uh, they took sometimes weeks. And it would be annoying to repeat the same experiment multiple times. But in the simulations, of course, we can do that. And what I tried to do is basically mimic what I think would happen if experimentalists tried to repeat the same experiment multiple times. So uh, the experimentalist would probably, for this example, uh, pick randomly 24 birds from the same species, where the same species is, or the, the species is, in my case, just characterized by this normal distribution with the uh, given mean and standard deviation. And then, on these 24 birds, the experimentalist would run again the same protocol. Now, because of sampling each time a different group of birds from the same species, one has to expect that there are differences uh, between the different runs of the same experiment. On top of that, even, of, even when one would fix the group of birds, repeating it with the same birds multiple times, again, one would, should expect variability, and this is, this is captured in my uh, model with stochastic action selection. Uh, so each run lives, gives a different result. But if I, I can compare it to the actual data, and if I pick the one that is closest uh, for 20,000 uh, simulations um, that, that I ran, if I pick the one that is closest, then we can see that it uh, captures the main characteristics of the data. This is not the case for a simpler model, even also simulating it for 20,000 times, where the simpler model does not have the hunger modulation, does not have this uh, uh, motivational control. And if we look across uh, the mean across all these 20,000 uh, experiments, simulated experiments, then this effect is even more prevalent. We see that the full model captures the main effect, but the simpler model doesn't. We can also look at this across all the five experiments that studied motivational control, and we see that the distribution of differences between simulated summaries and actual summaries has more mass at small difference, more mass close to zero for the full model, but not for the simpler model. Or looking at yet another measure, uh, this is the, free, uh, the, the, the fraction of simulated experiments where we would basically get the same conclusion as that one uh, that, that, that is reported in the paper. And also here we see that the full model reaches uh, with way higher probability the same conclusion as uh, the simpler model. Let me move on to the description of the associative memory module. So whenever a bird, uh, a simulated bird, caches a food item at a certain site, we bind together the cache site features with the food type in the associative memory. We now postulate that this association, the physical uh, location of this association, moves over time from one network to the next network through a process called system consolidation. So related ideas have been formulated in the trace transformation theory by uh, Sekhar Swinokor and Moskovich mostly, uh, to capture some phenomena around episodic memory in rodents and, and humans. We simply assume here that, for example, over the course of a night, the association between food type and cache site features moves from one network uh, to the next one. But more graded forms of uh, system consolidation would also be consistent with our model. If now the bird encounters again a cache site or a site where it has previously cached a food item, uh, the associated food type is retrieved from the associative memory in the memory network that corresponds to the age of the memory. And readout weights uh, indicate now whether it is worthwhile to retrieve this food item or if it is maybe already too old and probably already degraded or, uh, in the case of a berry, for example, still too fresh and not yet ripe. Importantly, these readout weights can be altered by feedback. For example, if the bird encounters that these uh, mealworms have already degraded after three days, uh, then this, can, this feedback uh, signal can be used to lower the readout weight from this uh, memory network. 
With this simple uh, model of associative memory, of episodic-like memory, we can capture, for example, the results in this experiment here, where, again, I compare it to the simpler model that does not have the associative uh, memory module um, and that does not capture the main effect in this study. If we look across all the experiments that looked at episodic-like memory, we see the main effect, uh, the same effect as before, that the full model has more mass at lower differences between simulated and actual data. And if we look at this uh, uh, measure, the fraction of simulated experiments that reach basically the same conclusion as uh, the, the, the paper, the experimental uh, paper, then we see again, that the full model uh, performs way better than the simpler model. So the associative memory allows or enables also a neat solution to the temporal credit assignment problem in learning uh, the, the caching policy. So whenever a cache site triggers the associative recall of a certain food type, the system has implicitly available all the information uh, that is needed to know that there must have been a caching um, uh, event in the past, I irrespectively of how long ago this is. And if now, after retrieval, there is some feedback uh, signaling whether this uh, caching action was good or not, it is as if uh, this feedback would have been given immediately after the caching action. So we can just use this simple reward-modulated plasticity rule during retrieval to um, update the caching policy. This is in agreement with the mnemonic associative account that uh, uh, I introduced to you in the, in the introduction. And of course, we cannot rule out mental time travel for uh, these experiments. Uh, in fact, when I started to work on this project, I hoped that I would find something like mental time, time travel. It's just, it would just be cool, right? Uh, but we can say that this simple mechanism is enough to account for the uh, experiments that we see, for the experimental results that we see on the adaptation to anticipated future need, where again, the simpler model uh, cannot do the task. So in conclusion, our model with motivational control and associative memory with system consolidation and the model-free reinforcement learning mechanism is in agreement with these 28 experiments on behavior of food caching birds. It is a simple heuristic solution to the decision-making problem in the specific partially observable domain faced by the food caching animals. And to come back to the point that I made in the introduction, I think that while the human episodic memory is, is certainly more flexible and humans do model-based reinforcement learning and planning, maybe simple heuristics like this recall-based solution to the temporal credit assignment problem may also, be, uh, may also appear in humans. So with this, I would like to thank my wonderful collaborators, uh, and I would like to thank you for staying with, with me, despite uh, me talking about food and, and hunger and, and so on. And you're probably all hungry. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. We're a little bit over time, and I think everybody is hungry. Unless there's an urgent question, I would say we will resume. Uh, back at 2 p.m. for the second session of... Um, I, I have one so question here. You have one question? Okay. Um, very quickly, the, your first point. So do you have one set of model parameters that can account for the results of all the 28 experiments? Or yes. Or different sets of models? It's one. It's one set of uh, parameters that can account for all the 28 experiments. Not in the abstract, but what I showed here today. This is the case. Thanks a lot again, and let's uh, come back at 2 p.m. for the cross-collaboration breakouts. Thank you.